In this video, we are continuing section 1.1 on propositional logic, and we are going to discuss operators and truth tables, and we'll specifically look at negation, conjunction, and disjunction. So we'll talk about what all of those are. So just as we take sentences, and we can form more complex ones using connecting words, things like not, and, or, if, then, or if and only if, things like that. We can do the same thing with propositions. So we can build more complex ones from simple ones using these connecting words. So the first example is negation, or I can think of this as the word not. So I'm going to let P be a proposition. And when I have the statement not P, which I can think of as the negation of P, this is a proposition. And the way I denote it is we put this sort of right angle symbol, and then I write P. And that just means not P or the negation of P. So let's look at an example. So I'm going to let R be the proposition, LeBron James plays basketball. So then not R would be the proposition, LeBron James does not play basketball. So one of the things that I can do with these operators when I build these other propositions is look at what's called their truth table to analyze the, what, when the situation, when the proposition is true and when it's false. So I'm going to be more general here. So I'm not going to use this specific R that I was working with. I'm going to call my proposition P. And then next to it, I'll have the negation of P. Okay, and then I'm going to draw a horizontal line underneath them. I'll draw a vertical line between them to separate out columns. So a proposition P could either be true, it could either be true, or it could be false. And if P is true, well, then not P would be false. And if P was false, then not P is true. And that is our first example of a truth table. This is the truth table that analyzes the proposition not P or the negation of P. Okay, let's look at another example. So our next, our next one of these operators is called conjunction. This is the fancy word for the word and. So for this, I am going to let P and Q be propositions, then P and Q is called the conjunction of P and Q. And I denote that by writing P, and then I write this sort of upside down V, and then I write Q. That's the way I notate P and Q. Okay, so I'm going to draw the truth table for this. This time, we need two propositions to build this new one, P. So I'll have a P, I'll have a Q. And then next to it, I'll put my P and Q. I'm going to draw my horizontal line. This time, I'm going to draw one vertical line next to P and Q. And on the other side, I'll have the building blocks, the P and the Q that formed this old, you know, final proposition that I have. So what are the possible truth values for P and Q? Well, P could be true or false. Same thing with Q. Q could also be true or false. So overall, there's going to be four possibilities, right? One of them is if P is true and Q is true. P could be true and Q is false. P could be false and Q is true. And P could be false and Q is false. All right. For my AND statement to be true, we need both, both P and Q need to be true in order for the whole AND statement to be true. So only in this first row, when both of them are true, will the final thing be true. Okay, and then when either one of them is false, or even if both of them are false, the AND statement is false. So the only way the whole AND statement could be true is if both P and Q are true. Okay, All right. let's look at another example of an operator. So this next one is called disjunction, which means OR. So P and Q are going to be propositions. P or Q is called the disjunction of P and Q. And the way I denote this is I write P, this time I just write a V symbol, and then I write Q. So this V symbol means the word or. So one more time, I'm going to make a truth table. So I'll have these building block propositions, P, Q. Next to it, I'll put my P or Q. I'll draw a horizontal line. And then I'll separate out the final proposition from the other building block ones with this vertical line. Um, again, 
the possibilities for the truth values of P and Q are, I could have true, true, I could have true, false, I could have false, true, or false, false. So when I think about P or Q, what it would take for the or statement to be true, well, this time I need either P or Q need to be true. It's just gonna take one of them being true for the or statement to be true. So in which rows do I have at least one of them being true? Well, that happens in the first one, because actually both are true. In the second one, because one of them is true there. In the third row, one of them is also true, so that's true. In the last one, well, both of them are false. And then my or statement is false. I need at least one of them to be true for the or statement to be true. Okay, so that's my truth table for my disjunction, for my or statement. All right, the last type of operator I'm gonna look at in this video is what's called the exclusive or operator. So the exclusive or, so it's slightly different from the or thing that I had here, and I'll talk about the difference. The way I'm gonna denote this is I'll write P, I'll write this circle with a plus inside of it, and then I'll write Q. Okay, so I'm gonna make the truth table for this. So I'll have P, Q, and then next to it, I'll have my P exclusive or Q. I'll draw a horizontal line, and then I'll separate out the final proposition from the earlier ones with the vertical one. Well, what the exclusive or means is, for this to be true, I want either P to be true or Q to be true, but not both. Like it's gotta be one or the other, but not both. So another way to say that is exactly, maybe I need a little bit more room, exactly one of P or Q need to be true. So it could be P being true or Q being true, but not both of them. Okay, so I'm gonna make my truth table. One kind of way to kind of systematically make sure I have gotten all my truth values is that with the final proposition here, I just alternate true, false, true, false. And I, I know that there's gonna be four overall because there were two of these propositions initially, and there's two choices for each of them. And then for the one before that, we alternate double trues and double falses. This is gonna be helpful when we have more of these propositions. Like when I have a third one, then I would alternate four trues and then there'd be four falses underneath that. It just helps me more systematically make sure I have all of them. Okay, so this time I need exactly one of them to be true for the whole thing to be true. And that happens in these middle two rows. So in the middle two rows, my exclusive or is true. But if both of them are false, it's false. And if both of them are true, that's also bad. So that's also false. Okay, so let's look at an example where we distinguish between these or statements and whether they're inclusive ors or exclusive ors. So in English, when we have sentences written down, we determine if the or is inclusive or exclusive from context. So this first or, my disjunction, is an inclusive or, which means even when both of them are true, it's still considered to be true. So another way to say that is an inclusive or means you know, either P is true or Q is true or both of them, that's fine. But for an exclusive, it's gotta be one or the other, but not both. Okay, all right, so in part A, it says I can wake up early or I can sleep in. I can wake up early or I can sleep in. Well, that's gotta be a one or the other. If I'm waking up early, I'm not sleeping in. So this is exclusive, but we can't do both at the same time. It's gotta be one or the other. Okay, my next statement says, people with kids or pets get less sleep. So is this inclusive or exclusive? People with kids or pets get less sleep. Well, I mean, people with kids get less sleep. People with pets get less sleep. Or it could be both. I mean, if they have kids and pets, that's double the reason to get less sleep. So this seems like an inclusive situation. So this is inclusive, inclusive here. So I wanna end this video with a quick memory tip about, well, how do I, how can I remember that the symbol for and and or? Cause they look so similar. So this symbol, my and symbol is like, one of the ways to remember it is it's like 
the symbol for an intersection when we think about sets. And we'll review these later in the course. But the symbol for an intersection is an upside down U. And an intersection, recall that if I have two sets, and I call one of them A and one of them B, an intersection means like the stuff that's in both of them. So it's in the overlap of the two regions. So an intersection is a fancy way to say the word and. Like I'm in, I'm in the stuff that's in A and it's in B. OK, so if I remember that this is intersection, I know that, OK, that's an upside down thing for and. Whereas this symbol reminds me of the symbol for union, which is just kind of a more of a normal U. And a union, when I think about two sets, A and B, well, the union means anything that's in A, as well as anything that's in B, as well as anything that's in both. So a union means the word or. Either I'm in A, or I'm in B, or I'm in both. So I, I just find it helpful to remember that, like, oh, the, word, the symbol for or and union is an up, upward-facing thing, kind of like this V is, a normal V. Whereas the symbol for and with an intersection is an upside-down U. And similarly for logic, it's an upside-down V.